technical aspects of the connection with, uh, with Simon. Hello? Hello? Yes, I'm here. Sam Simon, you're here. We, we, well, we don't see you, but you hear us. Okay, good, mo good morning. Good <coughs> Th thank you for waking up so early to be with us uh, and uh, to follow our uh, discussion since now. And uh, uh, Charles has just uh, finished his presentation. I said a few words on, uh, on, uh, your, on you and your uh, uh, position, uh, what you are doing, and, uh, and now it's the moment to, to listen to what you are telling us. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. I, I really uh, wish <clears throat> that I could be where with you. Venice is uh, one of my favorite cities in the world. I think that's why uh, so many people have come from so far to take part in this uh, um, meeting, it is a public good, and I wish I could be with my friends and uh, enjoy these discussions. So I want to talk to you about viewing Venice as a complex adaptive system. I will explain what that means and the particular challenges. And Charles's presentation has really set the stage very well for what I want to say. Um, I also want to acknowledge the various funding sources uh, that you see here that have uh, funded my work. Well, populations are growing, and as they grow, there's increased impact on the limited resources of the Earth, and the world becomes more interconnected due to population growth, which you can see on this graph, and its sustainability, of course, more fragile. This has been the theme of that's central to my work, the impact, as in my book of uh, 15 years ago, um, the impact that humans are having on their environment. The central problem that's facing societies is how do we achieve a sustainable future? And that means a lot of different things to different people. It certainly means the sustainability of our financial markets and our economic security. It means the sustainability of our energy systems and other natural resources, and particularly relevant to our discussion today it means the sustainability of biological and cultural diversity. Venice is a unique part of our, our global cultural heritage. But global population increase and the overflow into Venice, the number of tourists that one sees in Venice on any day, threatens um, the survival of the, those cultural benefits. For many of us, ecologists... Simon, sorry yeah. to stop you, but we, we are not able to see the slides, so you should share your screen with oh, I, us. I did. Okay, let me, let me start uh, again. I, I thought the screen was shared. There must be a, uh, um, a problem. Right, so uh, as populations grow, there's increasing impact on our limited resources. Yes. okay, okay. And, that, okay. That's uh, where I said, and I said this has been a theme of my work. I then um, began to emphasize that the central problem, go ahead, Anne, thank you very much. Uh, next slide. The, the, the central problem that's facing our societies is how do we achieve a sustainable future? Next slide. Uh, and sustainability means many things. I already emphasized the financial markets. Next slide the um, energy and other natural resources, next slide, the biological and cultural diversity, next slide, and the fact that Venice is a unique part of our, our global cultural heritage. So I think we are caught up. Um, global population expansion threatens these cultural services, next slide. And for, e for ecologists, uh, and of course, I think for everyone, it's the services that uh, any ecosystem provides, and Venice is an ecosystem, it's an urban ecosystem, that's part of our sustainability. Next slide. So across all of these, there are common challenges and common approaches. Um, we want to preserve the broad system features, uh, but individuals are really where the action is. Next. 
So in order to solve these problems, we have to recognize the connections between individuals and societies and how to do that scaling. Individual actions have emergent consequences at the levels of, system, of cities, at the levels of nations and beyond. And protecting what we value most has to involve incentivizing individuals to do something. And you heard a lot about that in what, uh, in what Charles just talked about. Next slide. So this may be recognizable to those of you, particularly from Italy. These are starlings, and I, I thank Claudio Correri for, and his collaborators for giving me this movie. These are starlings above Rome. Uh, <clears throat> and all except for one hawk that's driving the actions of this, of this group. And, and what's remarkable here is how individuals are responding just to their neighbors and to local cues, and yet we get these emergent patterns. These are the sorts of phenomena we're dealing with in dealing with um, our societies. Next slide. Just as collective actions in, um, in these bird flocks arise from individual behavior, so too this characterizes what goes on in human societies. And most of us are followers and there are very few leaders. Next slide. Um, and sometimes these collective actions have disastrous consequences as um, everybody uh, follows a, a few leaders and uh, we end up with overcrowding and uh, overuse of our resources. Next slide. Cities like Venice um, present the greatest challenges to us, perhaps. Next slide. Um, most people live in cities. And um, in fact, the number of people living in cities has been increasing. I put this clip in from China to, to point out from which I, where, where I, I just was about two weeks ago. Um, new mega cities are arising. The fraction of our population that's living in cities is continually increasing. Next slide. Now, of course, cities vary over a, a large range, and uh, um, and so the shifts into cities, making cities larger, uh, has to affect the way we deal with the problems uh, of cities. Next slide. In particular, associated with any cities, there are public goods, like the services we derive in the parks and the roads and the airports. But there are a lot of public baths. This is a cartoon of, of Beijing. The problems involve congestion and pollution and disease spread and crime. Next slide. Bigger cities, and Venice is not by the usual definition a big city, but of course it has the characteristics of a big city because of the number of visitors. Uh, the bigger cities have more public goods. They have um, the complementarity of function. You can find doctors and, um, and uh, others who service the society, and it's easier to do that in a big city. They can make decisions together. They can cooperate. They can establish governments that help uh, to provide services. But there are disadvantages. Um, there are the public bads like pollution. There's competition among in individuals um, for resources. We get conflicts of cultural norms. We get the loss of integration, the ghettoization that Tom Schelling talked about. And of course, government, which is a public good, can also be a public bad. Next slide. Uh, Schelling, whom I mentioned, of course, is famous for his simple demonstration, his simple sim uh, simulation of a half century ago, how ghettoization can arise uh, within cities. And uh, Venice is famous for the existence of uh, at least one ghetto. Um, 
as individuals tend to be attracted to be with those most similar to them, and this can cause divisions within the society. Next slide. Larger cities have typically much more inequality in the distribution of resources and the like. Next slide. But again, Venice is, is unique. It's not like other large cities. It's certainly not like other small cities because of the degree to which the population we see every day is made up of individuals who are not resident. Next slide. Most cities are like multicellular organisms. Um, the, they, they emerge, next slide. They uh, arise um, as individuals pick up functions that are needed, but again, Venice is different in this regard. Next bullet. The services that in Venice, for the most part, are, are directed, at least in the center of Venice, largely to benefit visitors rather than the residents. And the indigenous population is forced to live on the outskirts and without the basic services that um, we expect in, uh, in a typical city, even of the size of Venice. Next slide. Um, all of these, as I mentioned at the beginning, cities and nations and the biosphere and our societies are what we call complex adaptive systems. That means they're made up of collections of individuals, all different from each other, we call them agents, that interact with each other locally, and the whole system evolves. I don't mean in a genetic sense, but it changes based on the outcomes of those interactions. And then we get emergent properties that um, sometimes are good and uh, sometimes are bad. Next slide. Um, Am I losing you? Next slide. Um, so the, the fundamental question in dealing with sustainability is how do we enjoy the present without compromising the options that we leave for future generations? Next slide. We need to develop a comprehensive framework for answering that question. Um, and Charles started to talk about this. How do you measure utility, and how do you aggregate the utilities of multiple individuals and deal with individuals who aren't yet born? How do you deal with intertemporal social welfare? The, the question is, are we consuming too much? Are we imposing too, too large um, a burden on our societies for it to be sustainable? What are the implications for policy? Well, Charles and Ann Kinzig and I have been meeting off and on with a group of ecologists and economists over the last 25 years under the sponsorship of the Bayer Institute, the Swedish Academy of Sciences. And we've produced a series of papers, and one of them, um, headlined by the great economist Kenneth Arrow, asks, are we consuming too much? And it develops a framework, and I'm not going to put the equations um, up, but which First of all, in a standard economic parlance, computes what the benefits are to individuals and to their societies as a function of current use and use into the future discounted by when that usage comes. But the difference that in our formulation is we try to take into account natural capital um, and the other sorts of benefits that, that aren't in usual economic calculations. Next slide. And we applied that framework, this was work of a little more than a decade ago, um, to a variety of countries with and without the assumption of new technologies. And we asked, are these countries consuming too much? But this framework has never been applied to cities. It needs to be. Another problem, of course, is that many populations are aging. The latest meeting of the group that I just described to you dealt with the problem of population, focused to some extent on Japan, which is an aging population, and China, where the um, one-child policy, let me go back, where the one-child policy is ultimately going to create a situation where there are too few individuals 
around that are able to provide um, the support for the, for an aging population, most of whom will not be working. Next slide. Uh, Japan's population change you can see on this slide, and it shows a gradual decline, uh, very much a worrying signal. But take a look, next slide, at Venice's population, dramatic um, decrease in the um, it, in, in the average age of the population. Uh, I'm uh, sorry, um, dramatic decrease in population. Next slide, and um, and the population of, of the, the the resident population of of Venice is going down, while the number of tourists is going up dramatically. Next slide. And here you can see, and in in various ways, with the with the population of Venice broken down, depending on whether we're talking about the center of um, Venice and the, the the main island or the outskirts. But no matter which you look at, the population of Venice on any given day is heavily dominated by people who are not residents, people who, as Charles. And Ignacio just pointed out, should be sharing in the support because they derive benefits from it. Next slide. So this creates unique problems in preserving what is not only a public good, but it's a global public good. It's one where we all benefit. Now, what are public goods problems? They're, they're widespread in socioeconomic and ecological context. On, on the left, you I'm going to go back. On the left, you see fishermen and fishermen competing not only with each other, but with oil rigs. On the right, you see a termite mound. A, a termite mound is a is a public good. So we see these, that is where individuals have to get together to build something which is important to the society. So the sorts of problems we're, we're dealing with in socioeconomic systems are the same sorts of problems um, that um, biologists have confronted in a variety of venues. Go on. Now, the notion of a public good was uh, elucidated by uh, Paul Samuelson um, more than 60 years ago. Public goods are goods that everybody benefits from, but the technical definition of a public good is, um, is one such that my usage of it doesn't affect your ability to enjoy it. So these are what are called non-rivalrous and non-excludable. Everybody can benefit from them. Next slide. That, that means that technically they're distinguished from fisheries, which are what are called common pool resources, in the sense that if I take fish out of a common pool, it's no, they're no longer available for you to use. But there's a continuum. One often refers to these as public goods with congestion. And for this lecture, uh, I will just lump them together. Next slide. The prototypical public good, of course, is the commons that we all share. Venice is an example of a commons. William Forster Lloyd, two centuries ago, introduced the notion of a commons, very similar to the slide I showed you earlier, in which a variety of peoples using an area for different purposes must share it. And um, if, if the commons disappears, they all lose out. Next slide. But Garrett Hardin, whom you see on the left, talked about the tragedy of the commons, the notion that because nobody has sufficient interest uh, in sacrificing to preserve the commons, uh, the commons is endangered. Hardin talked about, next bullet, um, the solution being mutual coercion, mutually agreed upon. And generally speaking, he meant that, that there was a growth for government. But Eleanor Ostrom, who was a participant in many of the Bayer meetings that I mentioned earlier, um, another Nobel laureate, demonstrated that in small societies, particularly of fishermen, this mutual coercion could arise from the bottom up, that the individuals could 
group together in order to find solutions to the commons problem. Next slide. Um, globally, of course, we're eroding our public goods. Uh, and a variety of reasons we do so, you know, they mainly have to do with discounting. We discount the future and we discount the interests of others. Many of you flew to uh, Venice across the ocean and fortunately didn't have to yet suffer from having someone next to you talking on a cell phone, but that could be in our future. Um, individuals don't often respect the, um, um, the, the limited space of um, others or those who are not yet born. In general, in societies, we deal with public goods in a variety of ways. Uh, next slide. We may deal with them uh, with taxes, as Charles just talked about. We may deal, we deal with them to some extent through prosociality, from the fact that we care about others. But more generally, we develop reciprocal arrangements, agreements, and norms, and laws, and taxes, as Charles described, and other sorts of incentives. Next slide. Now, what are social norms? Why are they important? Well, social norms are the sorts of things Ignacio just talked about, the dollar that everybody pays um, to go on the reef, uh, which may be required in the case he described, but in many cases, um, particularly around Venice, as, as one goes into the, um, the great sites, there are places where people can contribute. Um, Ernst Fair, experimentalist, does experiments in which, in a large group, uh, he gives everybody some resources that they can either spend on themselves or they can contribute to a public good or they can use to punish others, presumably those who are not contributing to the public good. And he plays the game repeatedly. And what he finds is that individuals initially may be selfish, um, using the resources for themselves. Charles gave you some equations in which that was one term in the equation. And a few individuals contribute to the public goods, and a few other individuals use their resources, even at cost to themselves, to publish the individuals, to, to punish the individuals who uh, do not contribute to the public good. And over repeated iterations of this game, individuals start to punish more. They punish others who deviate from the social norms. Punishment itself becomes a norm. And understanding these norms and how they arise in our societies and why we do the things we do to preserve our societies are important to understand much pro-social behavior. Of course, often these norms eventually become formalized into taxes and rules uh, and laws. And um, this is the pathway to some of the solutions to the problems we've been discussing at this meeting. Next slide. Now, there, to some extent, this, the maintenance of norms depends upon fairness. That's what... Uh, um, Lynn Ostrom talked about, and with Alessandro Tavoni, who got his PhD with Carlo Corraro at University of uh, Venice Fascari, and Maya Schluter, we looked at uh, how norms could help to sustain resources like fisheries and aquifers. As individuals who wanted to preserve those resources banded together, agreed upon uh, more stable policies, and agreed upon punishment schemes, ostracism in this case, for those who didn't uh, sustain the norms. Uh, and I won't talk about that, but we explain, we, we investigate the, the situation under which those norms can be established. Next slide. With Avinash Dixit and Dan Rubenstein, I've been exploring another mechanism, which is the development of mutual um, insurance policies. This is a, a system used by um, herders in East Africa who share grazing grounds, um, allowing one herder to, uh, to transfer cattle uh, 
through um, through someone else's property, a neighbor's property, if the conditions in a particular year are not very good. Um, now, why? First of all, this works because climate is unpredictable, weather is unpredictable, and so individuals band together so they can exchange um, cattle. Um, and uh, and get a higher collective good, but what makes this work? Next slide, even even more effectively is that in many of these herder societies, there's a lot of kinship, and prosociality can be important. In the case of Venice, that's not the case. Um, most of us uh, are not the kin of the people who live in Venice, but we do feel a degree of prosociality. We care about Venice. Uh, whether or not uh, we visit it. Next slide. Now, there are many examples from biology that demonstrate that closeness in time, closeness in space, closeness in social networks can enhance cooperation. It leads to more of this um, prosociality. It leads to a reduced discounting, both of the future and of, of others' interest. It leads to these sorts of insurance agreements. Um, it leads to prosociality. But for Venice, um, how are we going to develop this sense of closeness? Well, of course, it arises to some extent from visits. It's going to uh, involve other ways to make people of the world recognize that Venice is part of their heritage. Next point. So we need to exploit that. Um, one of the other papers that that came out of um, the Bayer Institute meetings that I described earlier, one of the earliest ones, was called Economic Growth, Carrying Capacity, and the Environment. Next slide. And this was built to some, to a large extent, on a paper of my colleagues at Princeton, um, Alan Kruger and Gene Grossman, and it talked about that figure that you see at the bottom, the so-called inverted Kuznets curve, which shows that levels of pollution have an interesting relationship to the wealth of a society. That is, as societies become wealthier, pollution levels begin to go up as industry goes up, but the wealthiest societies have much lower pollution levels, according to a variety of measures. And it's for a couple of reasons, but one of which is there the nature of industry changes more towards non-polluting industry. But what's relevant to our discussions here is that wealthy nations export their bads. Um, and we see that as uh, uh, the number of visitors who come to Venice and impose a burden upon Venice. That's an overflow from, from um, other societies. So with Avinash Dixit, uh, 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 my colleague at Princeton, we've tried to extend the sorts of model that um, Charles just talked to you about to a situation where there are multiple groups. Uh, we began with a symmetric situation, but the, we, in this model, individual, and, and I'm gonna show you in a minute the only equations that I'm putting in this lecture, Consider a model in which individuals balance their own self-interest and the interests of their friends and their relatives and their neighbors. Uh, and then we study the effects of this local prosociality. One of the questions is, uh, oh, maybe the equations haven't made their way in, I'm not sure. Um, just slow down a little bit there. Ed. Um, one of the questions is whether we can extend that prosociality uh, to Venice. We also examine in a paper that's, uh, I'll show you in a, in, in a minute, that's in press, how prosociality itself can arise and how it can be passed from generation to generation. Next slide. Um, the, I, I remember that the equations I, I put into the slides I've got here, but they're not in what I sent last night. But they look a lot like the equations that Charles put up and which one can contribute either um, to one's own benefit or to the public good, and which there is some spillover so that uh, contributions to sustain a public good like Venice spill over to benefit individuals who don't live in Venice. 
So uh, go back. So in, in models of this sort, uh, benefits can be seen to arise even to those who are accidental recipients, who are um, not the intended beneficiaries. Question, and we have not begun to develop these models yet, but we must be build on this to, to preserve Venice, to extend the sorts of models that Charles talked about and that Avinash and I are working about, working on, to deal with these asymmetric situations. Next slide. Um, Lynn Ostrom, in one, one of her last papers, talked about how one can apply this sorts of modular reasoning to dealing with climate change. She talked about polycentricity, and others like Bill Nordhaus talk about climate clubs, the idea that one has to begin somewhere and smaller groups need to band together to get agreements that can be building blocks for a modular approach. Next slide. This really builds on um, something that evolution has known about for a long time, that building, that modules not only preserve systems by reducing the potential for systemic risk, but they also provide building blocks. In this case, one has to start somewhere, as I said. And um, next slide. In the case, case of climate change, I've been working with these gentlemen, uh, Phil Hannum, Vitor Vasconcelos, and George Pacheco, to try to develop this modular approach and apply it to global climate change agreements. Next, next slide. Um, I'll just tell you just briefly about this. The idea um, of the climate change modeling is that uh, um, individuals can join cooperatives. They pay a price to join those cooperatives. They join overlapping cooperatives. And then within those cooperatives, they may or may, may not agree, for example, to mitigate climate change. Those who mitigate pay yet an extra price and get extra benefits. And we explore this in a paper that's in press in climate change, the situation, climatic change rather, uh, under which this sort of cooperation uh, can lead to the resolution of, uh, in this case, climate change, uh, and provide benefits even to those who are not contributing. Next slide. Um, managing the commons is both an environmental and an evolutionary challenge. And human societies, as I've talked about, relies on mutual coercion, mutually agreed upon. Next slide. The users self-organize, they develop norms and institutions, they design sanctions. Next slide. Um, in order to maintain cooperation, in other words, individual restraint from short-sighted resource over-exploitation. In the case of the discussions we're having here, that means contributing to measures that, um, that reduce the impact on Venice and preserve it for future generations. Next slide. Societies, as I uh, suggested at the beginning, emerge as, as multicellular organisms. Most cities have this differentiation of functions of doctors and, and bakers and grocers, et cetera. Next slide. But, um, and, and Adam Smith talked about this, and he said, referring to the baker, that pers by pursuing his own <clears throat> interest, he frequently promotes the interests of society more effectually than when he really intends to promote it. This is called the, was called the invisible hand, and he suggested that societies, therefore, would self-organize and take care of themselves. But even Adam Smith recognized that self-interest often <clears throat> was not going to be consistent with the interests of societies. The invisible hand does not protect societies, and if we didn't know that before 2008, 2009, we certainly found that out then. We need um, some top-down influences. Ecological systems and socioeconomic systems alike are, as I said at the beginning, complex adaptive systems. Next slide. Um, sustainability means preserving local public goods and common pool resources. It means preserving the larger scale public goods, and I include Venice in this, where there's symmetry, but obviously there's asymmetry in the case of Venice because of the large number of visitors. So 
Sustainability is also going to mean preserving large-scale public goods where there's asymmetry. Charles began his, um, his modeling as I would uh, with a symmetric situation, everybody um, is the same, but then suggested that one has to modify that. And that's where the current theory uh, is lacking to deal with situations where there are great asymmetries. Next slide. Understanding that relies on prosociality. This is the paper I mentioned before that's in press in which Dixit and I asked, how can how is prosociality maintained? We've already explored what its consequences are, but how do we increase the degree of caring of individuals uh, for things that go beyond their immediate experience? Next slide. Um, so these are what I call asymmetric public goods. They're going to involve things like side payments, where the wealthier entities have the most to gain, but more difficult, dealing with equity and prosociality where this condition's not met. Next slide. Global sustainability has to encourage the things we're talking about here. Stewardship, cooperation, prosociality. Next slide. Um, and Venice involves great asymmetries, as I tried to lay it out. We need to exploit these frameworks like the one I described, like the one Charles described. Next slide. Um, I, Venice represents a great challenge that deserves our attention. I'm really honored that you asked me to join you today. I wish I could have been there in person, but I look forward to hearing some of the further discussions. Thank you very much. Okay, I should be able to hear you now, right? Yes. <clears throat> Any? Thank you for for your your presentation. Of course, was important for Venice, but I think it was also important in itself as a, to to the, the general problem of uh, for the number of things that uh, uh, you 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 put forward. And I, I just want to to underline two, two points that may be useful for, for the discussion. They are very important for Venice. The, the, the fact that you have been, thank you for having mentioned future generations, because when we think about uh, preserving Venice at its lagoon, we often tend to forget that uh, by, these are limited uh, resources. The, the, the lagoon is limited, uh, the cultural heritage is limited if we exploit them at too high rate, we are going to, to damage uh, our children, grandchildren, future generation. And uh, the other point I want to thank you is to have uh, devoted the final part of your presentation to the importance of uh, social norm and building a pro-social attitude as I have understood a sort of precondition to have uh, effective formal uh, rules. So behind formal rules, behind regulation, we must have the support of some shared social norm. And there is also the problem of how to build them. This is a very important aspect here in Venice because uh, I refer to the, the first presentation of this morning where he was mentioning the opportunity of building uh, a, a governance uh, a structure, and he also mentioned the opportunity, for example, to widen the, the interest uh, uh, concerning, for example, a wider area than Venice. And I wanted to, to, to point out what you also said before. When we, are, when we move to a wider areas, we have advantages and costs. In our cases of Venice, coordination may be an advantage between the local, agent, local institutions that are involved, but coordination must be based on uh, shared social norms. And competition for, resource, uh, for resources may be a, a disadvantage, and in order to avoid that, again, uh, there must be something that Venice is terribly lacking uh, this lack of uh, shared uh, social, social uh, informal norms. Uh, you, you also mentioned uh, Ostrom. Ostrom was also mentioned by Eve this morning. 
by saying that uh, what you also uh, noticed that Ostrom provided a number of examples of successful uh, common uh, managed resources of small size. But in the paper you mentioned the polycentric approach to climate change. The attempt was made to uh, deal with the global issue through a polycentric approach. And again here in Venice we have, if Venice is a local public good with global value, we have uh, a challenge in that direction. So there are a number of uh, topics that you have raised and I thank you very much and I also thank Anne for having helped us helped us to manage the, 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 the slides. Uh, uh, I certainly, <laughs> thank you.